Hi everybody, my name is Zach Pearl. I'm a sessional instructor in graphic design and integrated media at OCAD University. And I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo in the English department, where my dissertation research focuses on critical media studies. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of the embodied user, feeling one's way through digital space. This lecture comes in two parts and you'll be prompted to move on to part two at the end of this section. Part one, embodied interactions. Before we can start pulling that term apart, we need to start with some more basic definitions. What do we mean when we say interaction? This is a term that gets thrown around a lot casually in our everyday lives, especially in the context of our digital devices. But interaction is really so much more than that. And do we really think, stop to think about what it means? In its most basic sense, interaction is reciprocal action or influence. Reciprocal being the key word here, because it means that whatever is taking place between two or more parties, whether they be humans, or from a human to a piece of technology, like a smartphone, that the influence and the action are moving in both directions simultaneously. We can think about this in that an interaction is ongoing and takes place in the space between. So ongoing interaction between two languages is a great example since we have a translation process that happens. At the same time that information is being sent, it's also being received and processed by the opposite party. And this is humorously but poignantly illustrated uh, in the illustration to the left. In terms of interaction, none of it can be sensed without the presence of a feedback loop. No matter what we're interacting with, whether it's human or non-human, i.e. technology, we rely on stimulus from that thing, as well as our general environment, to perceive that any change is occurring at all. However, in contemporary culture, we do have a tendency to devalue one of the really important factors in this feedback loop, which is the body, especially when it comes to human-computer interactions. And, but in fact, everything about computer interfaces is designed to provide us with visual feedback and sometimes audio feedback, and especially in the case of handheld devices, tactile feedback uh, in the capacity of vibration and haptic surfaces. So touch screens are a great example of the way in which we also rely on sensations through our um, fingers and thumbs to alert us that something, some change is occurring. So even though we're several hundred years past the Renaissance now, our technological culture today continues to be saturated by a general kind of mind-body distinction. And this is a dualism that was most famously argued by French philosopher René Descartes, who said that the mind and body are definitely related, but that they operate in separate domains, meaning that they may be connected, but in his opinion, they are not interconnected. So today, we have a lot of technologies that are immaterial, they're intangible, we can't hold them, we can't sort of physically manipulate them, but they pervade our lives and they actually influence um, our daily lives quite heavily. And the intangibility of digital technologies has fooled us into believing that our bodies are not a key part of that interactive feedback loop that's taking place. Let's talk now about the word embodiment. Here's my personal definition that comes again in two parts. Embodiment is the material and social conditions of having a body. So this means both the physical as well as the social and cultural factors that inform us about what it means to have a body in the world, especially in terms of language. So the words that we use to describe our bodies, the um, the context in which it happens, where it happens, when it happens, and especially culturally, what's considered appropriate or not appropriate in terms of talking about our bodies. But 
In a more basic sense, we also just have the grounded sensation of what it means to be in a physical body and be in one's own physical body. So if we look at this super fun time lapse photograph that's over on the left, to do a cartwheel, not only do you need to have limbs, so you need to have extensions into space of the body um, in order to perform a gymnastic task like a cartwheel, but we also need to be able to sense other things like gravity, like speed and direction, and to orient ourselves within that space in order to flip ourselves upside down and make ourselves right again. So we're not just a floating brain or an eyeball that kind of, you know, um, meanders through the world. We have this uh, grounded entity of a body that gives us the sensation of all of these things, gravity, speed, direction, movement, mass, weight. Um, and even more importantly, it allows us to connect to other materials in the world in order to accomplish other tasks. So if we think about technology, the word technology more holistically, um, the root of that word is actually a Greek word called techni. Now, you don't need to know this word or memorize it. It's not, you're not going to be quizzed at the end of this lecture. But what's interesting is that techni, which stands in ancient Greek for tool, then means that all technology is based on the idea of a tool, which then means that it needs to have, there needs to be some kind of a body to connect to that tool and to operate it in order to accomplish a given task. So ostensibly, there can be no technology without embodiment. This same line of thought and inquiry is really no different when it comes to the way that we think about our smartphones um, and how we activate them through specific physical motions like tapping, sliding, scrolling, or even clacking away on the keys of our keyboards um, the experience of navigating digital space then is always firstly mediated by our bodies and the experience of moving our bodies through space. The sense of gravity there, the weight of whatever it is that we're holding and interacting with, and other sensory organs like our eyes especially that can apprehend depth, that can see color and pattern, um, our hands with their fingers and opposable thumbs that can grab things, push, slide, point, and swipe. None of those motions would be possible without the particular kind of bodies that we inhabit. The idea of embodiment matters especially in something called HCI. HCI stands for Human-Computer Interaction. This is a field that's multidisciplinary, and I'll get to that point in just a second, but mainly it's focused on the design of computers and more recently and generally information technologies, always from a human and embodied perspective. I say recent, more recently information technologies because HCI began in the late 1970s with the first personal computers and of course now we have a vast array of technologies that involve human bodies interacting with digital spaces. Um, HCI can be thought of as a predecessor to some other terms and as aspects of interaction design that you may be for, more familiar with, such as user experience and user interface design. Um, but HCI kind of is, depending on how you want to think about it, either above or below. It creates a big kind of web or net in which other things like UX and UI exist within as a framework. HCI, like I said before, is a multidisciplinary field, which is exciting because it includes things like graphic design and design practice more generally, as well as many other types of practice. Engineering, computer science, cognitive science, psychology, media theory, and personally I've even seen librarians and philosophers who identify as being part of the HCI movement. Somebody in HCI who's done a lot of thinking about all of these systems, how they interrelate, and also how the idea of embodiment hugely factors into that relationship is Paul Durish. 
Paul Dorish is a professor of informatics in the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. And he also, interestingly, has a cross appointment in the Department of Anthropology there. And the reason that this is interesting is because it means that Dorish has studied um, human history and human culture in equal capacity as he has to thinking about machines and digital spaces. Um, according to his own website, dorish.com, quote, my research lies at the intersection of computer science and social science with a particular interest in the social and cultural dimensions of data and digital practice. So Dorish is concerned about how things like data, even though they're immaterial, still have material impacts on us that become realities of the social systems and structures that we live in, and also the culture, whether it's our own sort of um, uh, individual family culture and practices or the wider things affecting um, technology like pop culture. So all of these come together in Dorish's view to create a sense of embodiment. In the book, he offers his own unique um, definition of embodiment, which I'll go through here. Embodiment is the common way in which we encounter physical and social reality in the everyday world. Embodied phenomena are ones we encounter directly rather than abstractly. Now this highlighted part in green is important because what he means is that we feel our way through the world and embodiment is a feeling. It doesn't necessarily mean that we get a physical tingling sensation in our gut. It doesn't have to be that sort of physically pronounced, but the felt sensation of the world as we move through it. And Dorish would say that social reality, the social factors, things like where we're born, um, our family structures, uh, the kind of education that we've had, the type of job that we've had and what it allows us access to in the world, all of these things actually are felt as well as understood cognitively in the brain. He says, certainly embodiment retains this notion of imminent presence and of the fact that something occurs in the world, but it need not rest on a purely physical foundation. Embodiment extends to other phenomena that unfold directly in the world, such as conversations, mutually engaged actions, and so on. And this can even extend to things like affect, which is a fancy way of saying the, the feelings and emotions that are attached to our interactions with other people and things in the world. So for Dourish, embodiment is all of that physical stuff, but it also has other less tangible layers that inform it. He says, what I am claiming for embodied interaction is not simply that it is a form of interaction that is embodied, but rather that it is an approach to the design and analysis of interaction that takes embodiment to be central to, even constitutive of, the whole phenomenon. So the radical argument that Durish makes is that embodiment is something that needs to be thought of as the very first factor from a design perspective. When we sit down to create digital interactions, whether it's a website or an app or some kind of interface for a tool that we're designing, we have to take, according to Durish anyway, we have to take the body and all of the other sort of related factors that contribute to our sense of having a body into consideration as the base before we start to add on any of the other features or layers of information. For the final part of this first part of the lecture, I'd like to do a little experiment here visually. Um, but first, we need to add one more definition to the mix because I believe, and this is a word that Dorish uses in his book, a great way to think about his idea of embodied interaction is another related term, which is phenomenology. Now this can be a kind of scary looking word because it's long and it's got ology at the end of it, so it sounds very hoity and complex. But if we break it down, Really, phenomenology is the critical study of events and lived experiences from a first-person point of view. So really, all of us have the capacity to think about things in terms of phenomenology because we all experience the world through a first-person point of view. The difference is that 
it becomes a critical study when we take that first person perspective and we start comparing it to other people's first person's perspectives of the same event. So we're going to do some of that in a very um, kind of limited way here in the next little bit. Um, by imagining what this, oh, sorry, by imagining what this simple smartphone interaction um, might be in terms of the phenomenology and the embodied factors that complicate it. So I'll start in a very basic way here just by mapping the truly physical parts of this interaction. So I put a node on the chest slash torso and physically for this motion of interacting with the smartphone to happen, we have to use the arm. And so here we might feel motion and then a center of gravity in the wrist, which moves up into the center of the knuckle to operate the index finger. And of course, the point of the index finger being the point of contact with the, t with the touch screen itself, which then we hit the threshold of physical to digital spaces. This is a very um, important but kind of crude way of thinking about how the articulated mechanics of the human body actually allow us to interact with the smartphone. So all of these steps have to happen within a number of seconds as we move our arm and our hand towards the device. So there is quite a lot happening there. But we can extrapolate this and think about an expanded kind of Dourish style of embodiment if we think about the other social and cultural factors in the environment while this interaction is happening. So I'm going to do a little bit of speculation here. Let's say that the motivation for using the smartphone is because this person is hungry. So we have hunger emanating in the gut as a felt sensation, moving up and outward through the body as it moves towards the phone to possibly search for a nearby restaurant or cafe to satisfy that hunger. So immediately we have the external moving, or sorry, the internal moving to the external. And so we cross the boundary of the self to the environment in the course of the interaction. Now, let's complicate it a little bit by saying, well, we're hungry because we're in this historic building district. There's lots of cool places around. They have awesome interiors, good variety of cuisine. This has motivated us to get on our phone and look for a place in the nearby um, neighborhoods. But because it's a historic building district and it's very popular, maybe it's also rush hour, there's lots of foot traffic, there's lots of noise, there's people moving around, at least, you know, in the before times there were. And so there's a lot of visual distraction, there's a lot of noise and audio distraction. That might make a difference for some people, and let's say for, that, for this user, it does. It complicates the interaction because there's a lot happening in the background. At the same time, all of those people also have devices, and because they're also in this historic building district with lots of big stone buildings that have steel girders and iron. Um, there's a lot of, you know, reflection, sorry, not reflection, deflection of the Wi-Fi signal. And this is actually hurting us and decreasing the quality of the interaction because of the poor connection. Adding on to that, it's December, it's damp, it's cold outside, it's not the most comfortable weather to be standing around and looking for a place to eat, so we're feeling that on our hands and on our, our face probably, and it's, it's happening in the mix simultaneously with these other forms of uh, sense, felt sense of the environment. And then let's say finally, just in an imagined context, that we have some chronic arthritis. And not only are we sensing the damp and the cold on the surface of our skin, but we're also feeling it in our knuckle, which directly impacts our ability to tap and to scroll and to slide. And so all of the interaction is complicated by factors that are internal and are external, and it creates this total constellation that really something as simple as looking for a nearby cafe is this whole network of sort of conditions that map themselves um, onto one another. So, as we close out this first part of the lecture, here are some questions for designers to ask themselves in the context of embodied interaction. One, how can embodiment play a more critical role in my own design process? So before you start sketching or wireframing or doing anything to map out 
what an interface or a website is going to look like. Are you considering embodiment and the body of the user? And how can that inform your design process, especially your ideation process, before you even get going? Two, what factors of your own embodied experience impact the way that you interact with digital media in your own life? In particular, which ones do you think are shared and more universal? And which ones are unique to yourself? And thinking about that carefully can also reveal some of your biases. And this is an issue that we'll return to in the second half of the lecture. And finally, what strategies or techniques could you use to emphasize the presence of the body in digital spaces, in your own work? And this could be a technical thing, like depending on the digital tools that you choose in order to execute your work, or it could be more general in terms of, let's say, the visual language. But how can you find ways to emphasize the presence of the body in the digital designs that you make? All right, so it could be useful at this point to jot these things down or take a screenshot of this slide and keep it open as you look at the second part of the lecture. Um, but we'll come back to these questions and maybe not necessarily answer them, but definitely explore their circumstances and their importance um, for designing interactive experiences. Okay, this concludes the first part of the lecture. Thanks for tuning in. Talk soon.